Good morning. My name is Georgia and I'm currently a Year 12 student attending Warwick Senior High School in Perth, Western Australia. My idea of the medical industry in 20 years' time is an image constructed by the advancements in medical technology. As the past 10 years alone have shown dramatic advancements from electronic health records to insulin pumps and pacemakers. These technologies and many others have proved to cause breakthroughs in the health industry and providing easy to use, more comfortable to use and hassle free treatments for patients suffering chronic and short term illness. The benefits of these past successes to doctors and nurses in the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of health issues, I believe will ensure future, will inspire future engineers and doctors to further enhance technology in the medical industry. Picture longer life. Through the use of a nanobot um, immune system and meshing man with technology, the collaboration of modern technology can work to heal the human body internally as it starts to deteriorate um, without the use of an external doctor and diagnosis. Microscopic technology that lives inside the body to heal and prevent early signs of disease, longer life and less time spent in hospital hospitals could be in our future. As technology is getting smaller and smaller and yet more and more powerful, this could be combined with the human body to manipulate functioning of bodily systems. When they begin to fail, the technology takes over and works to heal. I believe that in 20 years, cancer will be a thing of the past and a nanobot immune system could be one of these reasons why. The, enhancement, the enhanced technology detects and the infects infected cancerous cells and destroys them at the source, eliminating the need for chemotherapy and the killing of healthy body cells. What, is, um, what if life-saving and monitoring technology could be shrunken and manipulated so that our bodies are monitored 24-7 through our clothing? Engineered clothing could track and record all body functioning and changes that could be harmful. Imagine a singlet that is worn under normal clothing that beeps and alerts authorities and the person when they are or are going to have a stroke or go into cardiac arrest. This would allow services to be on the scene as soon as possible and when the patient would stop activity and prepare for compromised body functioning. The clothing could also be designed to administer appropriate medication to reduce effects of sudden illness until help arrives, such as a saline solution to lower core body temperature for heart for heart attack patients, or a, short, a shot of adrenaline for patients with anaphylaxis. As the saying goes, prevention is better than a cure, as the enhancements in technology would be a representation of this motto. It's easier to stop something happening in the first place than to repair the damage after it has happened. When the person performs an action or consumes substances that are harmful to the body, the clothing would detect this and warn the person when enough is enough such as having more than two standard drinks or um, smoking. This form of technology could be tied to the current Ottawa Charter under the area of reorienting health services, as people that are in remote and isolated areas are, unable, are able to wear the clothing and their condition is alerted and their location is recorded for help to arrive despite the individual not having access to communicate that they, in, they are in trouble. There are several proposed technologies that could one day be a reality in the medical industry. Imagine holographic scanning and being able to view a 3D image of inside a person's body. Cloning the anatomy to be, set, to be stored and used for organs. Um, genetic code altering, being able to change a person's DNA to get rid of an inherited harmful disease. Surgeries done remotely by surgeons and a machine working on the patient. The possibilities are endless. The evolution of medical technology will always dictate our future. I look forward to seeing our predictions becoming true and what the world of health will look like in 20 years' time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicola Hames. I'm 16 and a Year 11 student at Warwick Senior High School. I'd like to take this short time to raise the issue of adolescent mental, health il uh, mental illness. Sorry. When I was first posed with the question, where would you like to see the world in 20 years, my mind ran rampant with fleeting thoughts of levitation, teleportation and flying cars. <laughs> but these ideas were simply novel. And so I thought about the here and now, about my life, the lives of my friends and peers, and the lives of people around the world. The here and now helps us understand where the world may be within 20 years. 
The here and now, oh, sorry, my generation will be the world leaders, sporting champions, and maybe even the homeless person on the side of the street pleading for help and change in the world. Adolescent mental health deterioration is a real and scary epidemic. If we continue to ignore it and the stigma that surrounds it, there will be no young people to affect social change, create a better future, or to follow on from the phenomenal research of some of the people in this very room. As a high school, as a high school student, I've witnessed firsthand the way in which educational and demographic adversity can contribute to mental health deterioration. Around 26% of adolescent Australians suffer from diagnosed mental illness. Cases of mental illness in students are being ignored and dragged from the eyes of schools, not just in Perth, but around Australia. We are taught from a young age to eat right and exercise with programs like Crunch and Sit, but where are the programs that inform us that we can talk about problems? I think that it's about time we introduce a mental health management plan that must be implemented in high schools to give students the ability and knowledge to access help and identify possible cases, not just in themselves, but in, in their peers. I want to see the number of adolescents with mental health issues halving in 20 years, instead of tripling in 10 like we've seen between 2007 and 2017. To help with this, we need to stop letting people maintain the bad stigma around mental illness through misuse of sicknesses as descriptors. We must educate and enforce rules to stop non-sufferers claiming illness incorrectly, like saying they must have obsessive compulsive dis disorder because they like to keep things neat. The government needs to enforce a plan that is compulsory in high schools and needs to train teachers for them to be able to identify and instruct students towards appropriate help. Start making services available. In your state, or if you're an international visitor in your country, make people know about the kids that will be in charge. We can and will make change when we're older, but we need accessible psychological support to be the best that we can in the future. Don't let the kid that could save your very life die because of an issue that could have been helped or prevented. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Woodruff and I'm 15 years old in Year 11 at Warwick Senior High School, which is located in the northern suburbs of Perth in Western Australia. To give you some background to where I'm from, our school is located in a low social economic area with the unemployment rates currently sitting around 25% in not only Warwick but the surrounding suburbs. We attend a small school of roughly 620 students from year 7 to 12. The young people of today are raised in a world of advanced technology and improved sciences in which we understand the impacts of the actions of the generations before us. By the ability to attain this information, we understand that we need to take a stand to prevent, to preserve our natural resources and counteract the damages that have been done to our world. In 20 years, I believe we can attain this by a goal setting, seeing huge companies change their business models, having medications used for preventions, not just treatments, and because of the new attitudes, beliefs, values, and mindsets of the generations which will influence factors within the way in which we enforce technology. Lowering the amount of poverty and mortality rates in third world countries is something that needs to be urgently addressed. Some strategies to combat this epidemic include reducing the numbers of children working in unfit conditions, especially in countries such as India, where 1.4% of their child po population aged between 5 and 14 are part of the working industry. This needs to be urgently changed because of the significant effects that the lack of education as a result of no free time and exposure to the harmful diseases can have on the future of these children. Another major factor involved with the high rates in mortality and poverty is the inability to obtain resources such as food. Food is a vital element in sustaining life on earth and is something that we should be shared equally around the world and is something we should be putting in progress within 20 years. This problem we have with food is not that we don't have enough, but is that we don't distribute the produce evenly throughout the world, mainly because of the division between different countries and the fight to be on top or the leader. As a result of this, we have ob obesity, which has reached an epidemic prosperity, affecting at least 30% of the adult population globally. But then we also have almost half of the world living in poverty and dying because of the lack of nutrition. These are all factors that can be changed as long as we can get over the barrier between the different countries. Imagine in 20 years' time, if drug companies change their business models to help people instead of just looking for the profit, could we see medication used as a prevention tool rather than treatment for cures? Thank you. Before I begin, I would like to pay the respects to the traditional owners of this land and extend that respect to any present elder of First Nations people here today. 
My name is Ryan Peters, and I'm a proud Wiradjuri man growing up in the direct land referred to as Blacktown, with heritage belonging to the Ryan and Grave family, majoritively belonging to what is known now as Dubbo and Wellington, rural Western New South Wales. I also identify with my father's heritage, which belongs to Australian English and German ancestry. A little backstory about myself. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of New South Wales, as you know. Both of my great-grandmother and my grandmother were part of the stolen generation. I'm, fortunate, <clears throat> I'm also fortunate in reaching almost eight years remission from Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. So both of these aspects heavily influenced me to one day become the best, pe best public health physician that my people can have. So, <laughs> Ah, stop it, stop it. <laughs> I stand here today talking about where I'd personally like to see public health efforts made within 20 years' time as an Indigenous Australian medical student. When I think about our young people, my mind immediately links with health burden relating to drug and alcohol, mental health and sexual health. But when I think of the potential impact that we can, that we can make together, my mind categorises into the following. Education, translational research, establishing coherent relationships, and empowering future Indigenous leaders. Being a medical student and only having five minutes to talk about this big topic, I'm going to specify the educational tools slash ideas I can think really make a change. So let me jot them up for you. So the first idea pays respect to Indigenous Australians, making approximately 3% of the total Australian population and disproportionately representing the, health, the national health burden. Therefore, there is no denying that this population needs attention, as you guys know. A way in doing this includes educating our fellow Indigenous individuals. In 2014, there were 204 registered Indigenous Australian doctors, which is 90 more than 2004, out of approximately 103,000 total registered medical practi practitioners within the Australian workforce. Of the same year, there were 310 Indigenous medical students such as myself. Although these growing rates are fantastic, they are significantly short of appropriate representation within the medical field. So firstly, I would like to see the continual efforts in increasing the number of Indigenous Australian medical practitioners. I also believe that it is essential in dismantling the poor, struggling black student narrative. This is counterintuitive when empowering our people and only works destructively in regards to normalising our roles within tertiary education environments. I believe there is an impact of Indigenous people pre-high school that is often missed. By empowering Indigenous Australian students at perhaps a primary school level or even before this level, we can actually make a possibility of this tertiary education as an option that is doable and practical. I also think it is essential to implement cultural immersion and anti-racism programs within university medical curriculum. A peer of mine is currently making efforts to do this within my university, but these efforts should be national if not international. This should not be a ticker box approach that is commonly seen within various workplaces, but rather an indigenous led forum that can freely communicate to the cohort in a question and answer format. I also believe that anecdotes hold power in that they transform statistics into real life people. Therefore, the use of this space should be led by Australian indigenous students and healthcare workers themselves. I would go on to say that social determinants of Australia's Indigenous people and other minority groups should be formally taught to all healthcare and alternative healthcare professionals. Another relevant point, there's heaps of them trying to get them through. Another relevant point includes careers advisors within high schools needing to be taught the alternative pathways Indigenous Australians can take into university. It is upsetting to hear that my, many of my peers, including myself, were told at a young age that we would not be smart enough or get the required marks to enter the medical field. Indigenous-led organisations such as LIME, which stands for Leaders in Indigenous Medical Education, and AIDA, Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, are vital for the longevity of our Indigenous medical student voice. These bodies work to support and empower us to become the effective leaders within our fields. For example, AIDA is working towards creating reconciliation plans with, within various colleges for alternative indigenous, indigenous entry pathways, which work towards increasing the much needed numbers of specialists within certain fields. University Indigenous support units such as Neurogilly at the University of New South Wales as well as many others in other universities are also vital in physically and emotionally supporting Indigenous students from all faculties. Neurogilly with the Rural Clinical School are also responsible in running initiatives such as winter school, pre-programs and Indigenous ambassadorship, all of which improve the number of Indigenous students within the universities. I can honestly say that without Neurogilly I would not be standing here today. 
The great work of Indigenous support units from various Australian universities should form baseline frameworks for more universities to ensure that this support is available nationally. Finally, within the educational scope, any initiatives to reduce living costs during universities university terms, such as the Shalom Gamma Rata Scholarship, which I am fortunate enough to be a part of, should expand. This scholarship has created a family of like-minded Indigenous students at Shalom College at, to, want, to want to make change and facilitates this behaviour by lessening the financial burden and providing academic and emotional support. This Jewish-led initiative has been the successful in creating slash helping graduate 30 Indigenous students, all of which include 18 doctors, which is really cool. Thus, if a like initiatives would expand to other initiatives, I can only imagine that this success could only grow. And I think that's all, but like, I have so much more ideas, so if you have any questions, come up to me and I'll talk to you, but thank you for that. I have to say, it's hard following those other students, and um, I just wanted to say something that is not actually on my speech. Ryan said, you know, we need to stop talking about the poor Aboriginal student, and I have to agree. Uh, my brother was told when I was in Year 12 and he was in Year 7, if you're not careful, you'll end up like your sister. So um, I say to that teacher, I hope my brother ends up like me. <laughs> I, of course, would also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of this land, and pay my respects to elders past and present, to all Indigenous people in the room, and to everyone else that's with us today. Nothing about us without us. It's a saying that's used a lot in Indigenous affairs. Pat Dudgeon said it at the Suicide Prevention World Leaders Dialogue. My challenge in public health for you guys is to actually take that one step further. Nothing about us that is not led by us. I want to see Indigenous people not just at the table, but at the head of the table, leading. I don't want to continue to see the token black. I want our mob designing, implementing and evaluating our business. No one should be speaking on our behalf. I expect Indigenous voices to be privileged and prioritised on our own business. We shouldn't just be consulted on our issues. We should be making the decisions ourselves. Why doesn't this happen already? I believe this is for two main reasons. One, the clear power imbalance, and also the deficit lens through which we're viewed. And I don't think that these things are exclusively Australian Indigenous issues either. They're felt by Indigenous peoples around the world. Across the world, Aboriginality and Indigeneity has been defined and owned by non-Indigenous pe non people. We've been told where we can live, who we can marry, what we can eat. The UN Permanent Forum is on Indigenous issues. It's not led by us. The majority has the power. I've worked across a number of public health fields, including research, policy and media. All of those spaces when it comes to Indigenous affairs are dominated by non-Indigenous people. We have a research project in this country which is looking at Indigenous cultural competency, which is funded by the Australian Health Minister's Council, which is led by non-Indigenous people. We have the former Premier of Western Australia, Colin Barnett, announcing that he was going to close up to 200 Ab Aboriginal communities without consulting any of those communities. The Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Nigel Scullion, just recently launched $10 million for a pilot suicide prevention project without discussing it with the pilot communities first. Now, Ivor Einstein said, the de definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. For the last 200 odd years, the lack of Indigenous engagement in our affairs hasn't really done us any favours. It's time for non-Indigenous Australians to stop pretending that they are the solution. We are. <laughs> While non-Indigenous Australians are making decisions on our behalf, they're part of the problem. 
Now, we aren't perfect, we're going to make mistakes, there's no doubt about it, but I stand here knowing we will do better than what's being done for us currently. And it's not just the power imbalance which holds us back, but the deficit lens from which we're viewed. I recognise that it's the gap in life expectancy and the overrepresentation in the criminal justice system which drives investment in Indigenous affairs. But what I also recognise is that the drawback of this is that we are constantly seen as deficit. Dr Chelsea Bond, who's been here this week, has actually said, charting a community's deficit only seems to deepen the despair. And while we continue to be only seen as deficit, how are we ever going to be trusted to run our own affairs? Now, this is not to say that there's not a space for non-Indigenous people. There most clearly is. As Ryan pointed out, we're only 3% of the population. We can't do this by ourselves. We need strong allies. We need people who will actually support us to do things our way. We need people to act as a facilitator and use their white privilege to our advantage. We need Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country to be the directors and actors of our own affairs with non-Indigenous people to be the backstage crew. Now, I stand here because of the people that have come before me and who continue to support me, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Some of them are in the room here with me today. Michael Moore is the reason why I am a strong part of the PHAA, and I say thank you to him. Melissa Sweet, who I have gotten involved with with Crokey. And there's other people in my life, like Jenny Judd, who's one of my supervisors, the non-Indigenous people. But there's also a large number of Indigenous people who have supported me. My mother, she always gets a big shout out. Always. Les Mauser, Jeff Scott, the list could go on. Now, I, I actually had a little addition to my speech beforehand because of the World Federation of Public Health Associations uh, meeting that they had. So I stand here and recognise there's over 300 million recognised Indigenous people around the world, and I stand here confident and happy to announce that the World Federation has supported the need for an Indigenous working group. Now, that Indigenous working group was born here at the Yarning Circle that you would have seen outside. We had 40 delegates from around the world, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, come to discuss it and, and agreed with it. And that is now, it's we're at the 50th year of the World Federation and we have our first Indigenous working group. Now this will be led by Adrian Tepatu from New Zealand. I finish by saying, nothing about us without us, nothing about us that's not led by us. <laughs>